HBI is on the move. Drones. These aerial robots are replacing manned planes. They're revolutionizing warfare by allowing us to see and kill from half a world away. This is the ultimate melding of man and machine. The U.S. has more than 2,300 manned fighter planes. Tiger two, dark star pictures. And pilots like Matt McDonough have long been our heroes. The best fighter pilots that I've seen are the ones that can make a quick decision when things are happening very quickly. But a revolution is underway as manned planes are replaced by drones. Are we approaching a time when movies like The Terminator become our reality? Oh, God. Some machines are starting to take over. A time when machines fly, think, and even kill on their own. Drones are aerial robots that carry visual sensors, navigation systems, Target acquired. and sometimes even weapons. They come in all shapes and sizes and go by a variety of names. The United States Air Force uses the term remotely piloted aircraft. They are also known as unmanned aerial vehicles or as the media likes to call them drones. Already, the Pentagon relies on a family of more than 10,000 drones, usually to spy, but sometimes to kill. Small enough to fit in a soldier's backpack, the three-foot-long Raven is the most widely used spy drone in the world. The stealthy Sentinel provided crucial intelligence in the raid to kill bin Laden. The killer Predator has flown thousands of missions since 2001. And the giant Global Hawk can stay aloft and spy for up to 35 hours. The military uses drones to support troops on the ground. The CIA maintains a covert drone program to find and target individuals. The government claims drones have helped to eliminate up to 70% of Al-Qaeda's top leadership. They've been so effective, the Air Force predicts nearly a third of its attack and fighter planes will be drones within a decade. Planes can fly longer, they can pull more Gs, they can be more precise when they bomb if a human is not in the cockpit. We're entering a new era when the supremacy of even the most advanced planes is being challenged as engineers take the pilot out of the cockpit. Holloman Air Force Base in southern New Mexico is the largest Air Force training base for operators of remotely piloted aircraft. My name is Chad. I'm a captain in the United States Air Force. For security reasons, we've been asked to uh, cover our last names to prevent us from potentially becoming a target of any kind. Captain Chad has flown remotely piloted aircraft in combat for three years and now teaches pilots to fly the world's most famous killer drone. It's known as the MQ-1, or more commonly, the Predator. The Predator has changed warfare, but it's just a hint of what's to come. Where we are in terms of unmanned aerial vehicles is about the same place we were with biplanes right after World War I. We are at the very, very early stages of realizing what the potential of unmanned aerial vehicles are. Unlike complex fighter planes that are engineered for speed and agility, the Predator is built for endurance, so it needs to be light and efficient. It's the weight of a pickup truck or so, about 2,000 pounds, and it's balanced pretty evenly on the wheels. And with one hand here, I can lift it up and, uh, and set it back down. The propeller-driven Predator cruises at only 84 miles per hour, and its four-cylinder engine burns about 300 times less fuel than a fighter jet. I can't say exactly how long it can stay up, but it is possible to stay up over 24 hours. A typical fighter plane can only fly for about two hours without refueling, and short angled wings keep it fast and maneuverable. But the Predator hovers five miles up, often in uncontested airspace, and its long wings maximize lift. So as you can see, it's got some flex to it. With no pilot to protect, 
a remotely piloted aircraft is much lighter and simpler than a manned plane. On a fighter, the pilot's support equipment and ejection system alone weigh as much as a Predator, which in place of a cockpit has a satellite control system. It's essentially the brains of the aircraft. It gives us the ability to communicate, uh, control, keep link with the aircraft and navigate it. The Predator's sensor ball carries daylight and infrared cameras. We can easily make out people from five, six miles away. The sensor ball also guides the Predator's two Hellfire missiles. From right here, we fire the laser, and the laser spot hits the ground. And then once we fire the missile, um, this is the seeker. So this seeker will find that laser spot on the ground and travel to that spot, giving us a very precise capability uh, of employing weapons. When conducting missions, remote pilots work out of small trailers on the ground. They control the Predator by satellite. This link is what makes it possible to take the human out of the cockpit and fly from virtually anywhere on the planet. It's tight, about uh, the size of a normal uh, shipping container. And a uh, shift it could be anywhere from two or three hours up to eight or more hours, depending on the situation. From trailers like this, pilots of the Predator and its larger cousin, the Reaper, have killed thousands of individuals since 2001. In this clip from Iraq, a Predator pilot sees two insurgents firing mortars towards a coalition airbase. He tracks them and finally shoots. Flash. The pilot's role is to support troops on the ground and go after threats while trying to minimize civilian casualties. We got a new with such high stakes, pilots like Chad need ongoing training. Today, he'll be flying the Reaper in an exercise 50 miles away in the New Mexico desert. All right, uh, Greg, you're gonna be my HVI. I have a uh, shadow on station. He's gonna be watching you. Uh, you're gonna be on. A group of former soldiers working for a company called Rally Point will run an exercise in which Chad will hunt down insurgents in a mock village. We'll strike you there. Once you, you die, stay there, drive. Dr Two will drive play insurgents, you and there. one will be a soldier on the ground communicating with Chad. About to take off now, so we're going to push the throttle up. And there we're up in the air. The training mission offers a rare glimpse into the mechanics of how the U.S. uses drones to support troops and prosecute its war on terror. The goal is to make it as realistic as possible so pilots can avoid mistakes when in battle. They should be checking in here probably in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so. It's going to be an MQ-9 Reaper. Check, check, check. If they're at 25,000 feet, which they generally work, uh, we're not going to be able to see them at all. It takes about half an hour to reach the mock village. Drones like the Reaper can fly on their own using autopilot and preset GPS locations but the Air Force still keeps human hands on the controls at all times. People have this concept of either it's a manned plane and the pilot's doing everything, or it's an unmanned plane and it's something out of the Terminator movies. The reality is it's in the middle right now for both the manned and the unmanned planes. Our mind tries to put it in terms of robot or human, but the reality is a mix. As Chad pilots the Reaper, his sensor operator, Jay, controls the cameras and lasers. On the ground, the fake insurgents enter the village as the Reaper hovers miles above. Bones 3-4, Rally 2 0, say status. Rally from Bones 3-4, uh, we uh, have eyes on the target. Looking Chad right gets direction from the soldier, whose handheld receiver and computer allow him to see what Chad sees. Stand by, Chad's there. call sign is Bones. The soldier goes by Rally. And Rally from Bones, uh, we have two packs moving around inside the northwest corner of the uh, compound. Bones 3-4 from Rally 2-0, continue to shadow. The soldier directs Chad and Jay to follow an HVI, or high value individual, dressed in black. Rally from Bones 3-4, looks like uh, the one individual wearing black is uh, now getting on the motorcycle and departing the group. Depending on the situation, 
The decision to kill comes from an intelligence officer who could be anywhere, a battle commander on the ground, or sometimes the pilot. Bonus 34 from Rally 20. Looks like that uh, personnel is stopping. Bonus 34, that's a firm. That's what we got up here. All right, what I'd like to do is go ahead and prosecute 9 Line Bravo 1. Copy. Master armed. The sensor operator targets using the laser. This will be a run against the target under our crosshairs. 10 seconds to release. Sensor, are you ready? Copy. Three, two, one, rifle. And bombs three, four, weapons away. 25 seconds time to flight. The Predator uses laser-guided Hellfire missiles. The weapons that can be used operate with an error distance of less than nine feet. You can put a weapon through a window-sized opening with ease. Five, four, three, two, one, splash. Rally, Bones 09, firm. we have a splash, stand by for BDA. And Bones Rally looks like good splash. Copy lasers off, and Master Arm is now safe. The efficiency of having a single craft able to find, follow, and eliminate a target like this in real time represents a revolution in warfare. Let's go back to the middle of the last century. During World War II, it took on the order of months to assemble intelligence from a variety of different sources, whether it be airborne, on the ground, to assimilate that information and then determine what targets might be hit. Then it took hundreds of aircraft and literally thousands of bombs to go out and attack a target using that information that had been developed over a period of months. Today, with the capabilities all wrapped up into one vehicle, the Predators and the Reapers in particular, you can accomplish that find, fix, finish cycle in a matter of single digit minutes. Before the Predator, the military had to design separate aircraft for intelligence gathering and attack. Reconnaissance was key, and after World War II, engineers built ultra-sophisticated spy planes. They went faster and higher than ever before to make sure the pilots and the information they gathered didn't fall into enemy hands. The SR-71 was triple sonic. In other words, it'd go over Mach 3. Max recorded altitude was 85,200 some feet. And there are several of us that have gone higher than that. Pilot Tony Bavacqua is one of a select group of men to fly the SR-71, a titanium spy plane built during the height of the Cold War that could take photos of the ground with 12-inch resolution from 90,000 feet. Literally faster than a rifle bullet, even missiles were too slow to catch it. I was the first person in the SR-71 to get shot at, and it was over Hanoi. You got an airplane that's going 22, 2300 miles an hour, and it's very, very difficult to even come close. They figure that the missile exploded about a mile below me, and we're in and out of there. No time. Thank God. <laughs> the cost of such speed was that the SR 71 needed to be refueled every two hours. But there was a slower alternative called the U 2. Bavakwa is one of only 12 pilots to have flown both operationally. I was very proud of being a U-2 pilot because of what we have done and what we're still doing. It's just a magnificent platform, does excellent reconnaissance. Still widely used today, nearly 60 years after its introduction, pilot endurance limits U-2 flight time to 12 hours. It's pretty demanding on, on their bodies. They have to wear a special high-altitude suit for it, and then it whites them out for a, a good couple of days. It fatigues them quite, quite a bit to go that high. Manned spy planes are not only limited by human endurance, they also bring the risk of pilot loss. 